You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by NAX. Whether it's for food, fuel, drinks, or snacks, about half the U.S. population shops at a convenience store every day. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. And now your host, Jeff Leonard. I'm that guy, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Carolyn Schneer, and we're going to talk about some pretty interesting things going on in Europe. And we're going to welcome our guest by Skype, Mark Woltman, uh, over in Europe, and he is going to tell us a little bit about issues that are affecting uh, different convenience stores there, what stores in Europe are like, and we're going to find out exactly what a blue banana is. Welcome, Mark. He is the NAX Director of Europe. Hey, uh, thank you for having me. So, Mark, when we talk about Europe, Europe is just like the U.S. in that there is no typical Europe. It, just like in the U.S., there's California, there's Texas, New England. Even different regions have different um, types of customers. But how is the European convenience store industry set up broadly? How does it look differently than U.S. convenience stores, whether uh, an emphasis on certain products or size of stores? Well, that's a that's a very good question, and as as you just said, um, Europe. Uh, I think you mentioned Europe is like the U.S. Uh, so there are a lot of states, and uh, none is like the other. Uh, I would say it's it's uh, from that point of view, it's even uh, it's even worse actually, because uh, you not only have forty plus countries in Europe. Um, it means that with forty plus countries, you have forty different governments, forty different sets of regulations. 40 different headquarters of retailers, 40 different sales organizations, and so on and so on. And on top of that, you have what you probably have in the US as well, uh, 40 different uh, consumer mindsets. Um, And that actually, all these differences shape the the landscape of convenience retailing all over Europe in, in very, very different ways. So just to um, mention a couple of examples um, if you look at the uk uh, and you talk about convenience retail um, stores come to mind that look like um, small size supermarkets very well organized very much into fresh and food to go Uh, in other countries like germany for example a big country in europe um, you have completely different types of stores when you think about the typical convenience store. You have a lot of very, very small uh, independent stores that you could compare to the U.S. Uh, mom and pop stores, for example. And um, in some countries in Europe, you have uh, like tobacco regulation, meaning you need to have a license to sell tobacco, like in France or in Austria, uh, which means you only have a certain channel that sells tobacco, and that usually is the convenience channel but you can imagine if that is the only channel uh, selling tobacco and having a license that these stores look very very different so uh, overall i would say convenience retail in europe uh, looks very different even if the consumer need for convenience might be similar uh, the stores itself look very very different and of course they're probably different in size too because there's more mass transit in europe And so there's more of an emphasis on that walk-up crowd and not necessarily for gas. So more of an emphasis on food. And is there the same in the United States, 83% of items purchased in a store are consumed within the hour. It's immediate consumption. Same hold true largely across Europe. Are there areas that are more in the way of uh, immediate consumption? And are there other places where pantry items are a little bit more popular? Well, if you uh, it, again, it's uh, very different. Uh, if you look at Scandinavia, for example, Scandinavia um, has a relatively low uh, population density in in, in total, um, because most of the countries are very far north and not that many people living there. So, a convenience retail outlet, even if that is a petrol station. Uh, shop um, serves a very different purpose Um, so it's not so much about immediate consumption but that is really the place to be to meet to socialize uh, to go there because just because there are no other stores uh, around it but if you look at um, what in Europe is is being called geographically the uh, the blue banana um, I don't know why it's blue but um, it's actually a banana shape if you look at um, 
a European map and you put uh, Western Germany, um, the very west of Germany in the middle, and you have a banana shape upwards towards London and a banana shape downwards to, uh, towards Milan in, in, in Italy, there you have um, millions of people living in, in very uh, large cities and, and having a very um, high population density where people take actually a lot of public transport. And in these areas, convenience retail in, in traffic locations and free high frequency locations, of course, serve the immediate consumption need of the customer very, very well. And you're absolutely right. I think there are some really good examples out there across Europe when it comes to uh, serving immediate consumption. Well, and in my experience, I've been mostly to the big cities in Europe, but um, the motorway stations are the ones that are probably outside of the big blue banana. Um, and that's there. They might be the same name as some of these um, more inner city, if you will, stores, um, but very, very different, almost a completely different look. And sometimes they're attached to larger um, petrol stations, but you know, almost like mini malls. Is that correct across Europe or just some of the places I've been? Um, I would say you do find that in every country, uh, in some more, in some less, but uh, the concept of uh, creating a destination convenience, as everyone calls it now, uh, so not just offering uh, a few items to sell because you also uh, offer food, but really um, to, to offer the whole package and to draw people to that um, not just store, but to that whole area of a, of a highway station um, out of very different reasons is something that is uh, being done all over Europe. And you can see families going there to have dinner, not because they were on the highway and just stopping by, but they are really going there um, or going on the weekend uh, to, to have your, your dinner uh, at the evening, to meet your friends, uh, to socialize. So that is something that you can see all over Europe, really. And that's something that'll probably continue as we see more stores here. I know, I believe it's Autostrada uh, in Italy is a model that a couple convenience stores have looked at in, in building out what their food offer is and looking at that type of community. Now, the other thing, Mark, I'm, I'm really struck by is what you had said earlier about 40 countries, 40 um, headquarters, but you're also talking about potentially 40 different types of borders to cross in how do you sell products, how do you obtain products, how do you source products. And with the challenges that convenience stores have in the U.S. going across a very big country, at least it's one country. So in Europe, how, how are items sourced? Is there more of an emphasis on local? Is there an opportunity to have U.S. suppliers look at the market or how did how does that market differ from the US both challenges and opportunities um when you think about borders i mean one thing you have to look at of course is the european union so there you at least have a very very large area of a common market so if you um come from outside that market and you want to sell something or if you are in that market and you want to source something uh, let's just put it that way once you're in that common market in that area you're in that area so it doesn't doesn't matter if you then sell the product uh, in the Netherlands or in Germany or in Belgium or in France. Um, but that, of course, is just the European Union. So that is roughly, in terms of number of countries, half of the 40-plus countries that I mentioned. Um, with, with the rest, it still is, if you want to get into that country, you have to go through all the bureaucracy uh, that you that you have normally uh, go through. And yes, of course, that is um, that is a burden and that is something to deal with, but I would have to say that is something that people de and companies dealt with ever since. Um, and having the European Union uh, as a common, as a single market um, is, is a relief to that. So it's not um, comparing it US to Europe, oh, this is worse. I think companies that are in Europe already or deal with Europe, they see that as their normal business and they know how to do that. 
Now, another issue you also spoke a little bit about previously was tobacco and the way that um, sometimes the um, there are tobacco shops, sometimes they're included within the stores. Um, but we do know just from um, my travels and from what we've heard Nax say previously, there's different life cycles of each issue like this one. So some, if I'm not mistaken, some countries may allow tobacco to be sold in this direction or that direction. So that's country to country across these 40 different bodies, correct? Um, yes, I mean, tobacco regulation is, um, well, the, it is driven by the European Union, within the European Union, but it is also driven uh, by the countries itself. Uh, when I was talking about the licensing system in, in Austria or, or um, France that has been uh, in place um, for many decades, um, and looking at Eastern European countries, for example, um, there, there are very different regulations on that. So. Um, Tobacco regulation is very different from country to country, um, but you were uh, mentioning uh, a life cycle, and, and you actually could uh, look at it like that. Um, it is not that the tobacco issues or the tobacco situation is, is so very different everywhere. I mean, it's it's the same issue that retailers have with tobacco or that markets have with tobacco. Uh, it's just within a life cycle, maybe at a different uh, point of a different point in time on this life cycle where tobacco regulation is. Some con some countries, some markets are further ahead with regulation. They have a dark market. They maybe have plain packaging. And some countries are a little bit behind and still allow um, selling tobacco products everywhere, unlicensed. Um, but it doesn't mean that this won't change. We know from this, well, looking at it as a life cycle, we know that everything will move towards uh, what the more developed countries on this life cycle, on this issue, uh, experience today. That's a lot to keep track of. So I'm glad that you're you're the one knowing what's going on in every <laughs> single one of those and someone can call and ask, should they uh, be in one uh, stage of it? <laughs> oh, sure. You'd, more than me anyway. Is there other issues um, like this that retailers throughout Europe can learn from or even outside here in the U.S.? Things that are in the starting stages of those life cycles, maybe here in the U.S. and are are, are already way beyond what we expect. Uh, definitely, I mean there there are there are very um, very different stages of of different issues and and if if you look at it, I mean what what we do as Nax is um, we have our uh, global issues life cycle, which basically is a survey of industry experts all around the globe that we several times a year we ask them. You are an expert in your industry, so this is retailers, suppliers, um, service providers, everyone who works with convenience retail, really. And we ask them, in your country, what actually are the top issues that uh, affect convenience retail? And on these issues, uh, if you would have to rate your country versus the rest of the world, where on, on a scale from 1 to 10, from very low developed to very high developed, would you actually rate your country? And um, this is something we do, we do every year. And interestingly, really, is that um, the, the result on what are the issues are 90% the same all over the world. So you mentioned just one, which is tobacco regulation. Yes, in some countries in Asia, this is on the lower end uh, of the life cycle, but still it is an issue. And on so in some countries like the UK, it is very well advanced with a dark market with plain packaging uh, coming and uh, uh, tobacco regulation is an issue. But if you look at, let's say, the top issues that there are around the world, I would say most retailers talk about regulation, of course, which is not just tobacco, but also sugar regulation, uh, salt regulation. Um, it is food service. Everyone is talking about food service and mainly about um, the, the growing competition of food service providers moving into selling FMCG, so becoming a competitor of convenience retail. And the big question that is being discussed is how can convenience retail move into better food service offers to compete against that and have the better offer in the end. I think that is one one really um, top of the list and something that is top of the list in Europe especially 
um, is supply chain integration, uh, especially um, vertical supply chain. Retailers are looking more and more into um, how can they grow out of being um, the retailer into really serving the entire supply chain from farm to fork, so to say, uh, for a convenience store. So what surprised you most about the latest survey? Was there, were there any surprises? Um, well, I think the big surprise for me, and that is uh, probably for me and with, with my history, I uh, worked with convenience retail, with the, with the convenience retail market in my professional past. Then I did a couple of other things, and then I came back to convenience retail. Um, and looking at the, the latest results uh, there, I saw that service as an income is one of the big issues that is being discussed. And service meaning um, I, as a convenience retailer, do not just sell FMCG. What else can I do? What kind of services can I offer that not just draw people into my store to sell FMCG, but that actually are profit center itself. And we have been discussing that 10, 15, 20 years ago uh, on a very basic level, but there was a lot of discussion. I remember that. Um, and this is today um, coming back as a discussion, but on a very, very different level. So suddenly, convenience retailers are not just thinking about, oh, maybe I could uh, also start selling uh, banking services or I could also offer some laundry services or something like that. But convenience retailers really think about how to expand their stores into becoming uh, expert centers for different kinds of trade and services uh, to make convenience retail a destination. That's that was surprising for me. That's something we've been talking about here most recently, um, car washes, things that uh, in the United States that, that people, Americans, can just find and um, at their neighborhood store and really help make the entire trip more convenient, a lot like you guys have done there. Um, so I'm going to quick change the topic a little bit, but encompassing this too. Um, we have a Convenience Summit Europe coming up in June, and I yes. think there's a lot of um, great store tours where people can come see this, um, but also they could learn about this this uh, life cycle and everything you just said in the survey, Correct. Yes, uh, we will definitely um, have that uh, that information available there as well. And yes, the Convenience Summit Europe, I mean, that is our annual conference here in Europe. And um, um, we will be, uh, well, we have a two-day full, fully packed and, and really, really good program. I can't reveal too much at the moment because we're in the planning phase, uh, but we will have some really great speakers for a two-day conference in London. And before London, we will have a two-day conference in Warsaw. We are in a different city uh, in Europe every year. So we did Stockholm, Berlin, Paris, Madrid before. Uh, this year, it will be Warsaw in Poland. Uh, where I'm really, really looking forward, not just to the to the conference, but also to the store tours that we will offer, because uh, Poland and especially Warsaw is a very progressive market. Um, a lot is really happening there. If you just think a little bit about history, um, I mean the East-West divide. It's not that long, uh, long ago, and Poland really. Uh, is a powerhouse in Eastern Europe. They developed very, very well. They showed very, uh, very good growth numbers. Uh, even through the credit crunch, Poland was growing. And you can see that. You can see how the retailers really invested and professionalized the convenience retail offer. So, yes, there's definitely a lot to learn from these sort of what I like about this conference is it, it is two cities, so it's, I'm going to steal it from a book, it's a tale of two <laughs> cities. So every year we have a traditional London conference where you really see progressive food service and what is going on in a major metropolitan area in small format. And this year going to Poland, looking at a emerging market where they're probably also able to, to take further leaps and bounds because they aren't as tied to tradition uh, of a, a fully grown market. And that's very intriguing. You had mentioned earlier about the Eastern Europe and, and how there's a lot of progressive things going on. So this this is going to be a very interesting conference, and particularly what you can see, I think, will be very interesting in terms of the dynamics of how stores look in Europe. So that is definitely something to put on your calendar and take a look at Nax online to learn more about that. But it, Mark, Want to want to at least ask this in that 
recently Nax underwent a, a brand transformation, and, and part of the reason was we wanted to take we want to go from national association of convenience stores to Nax. We are international. We are not just national. So why should Nax be playing in this space? Uh, I, I know the answer. I, I'm sure you have an even better answer. <laughs> Why should we be playing in the global space? And what can everybody from around the world learn by playing in this global space? Uh, well, thank you uh, for the credits. I don't know if I do have a better answer uh, than you have, but uh, I, I do have an answer. Um, when when I... Uh, well, when I started in my role as Director of Europe for Max, the first thing I did was um, I reached out to retailers and, and suppliers all over Europe, and I asked them, um, what do you need, and why do you need it, and why isn't your need being served at the moment? <laughs> and uh, what everyone told me is that on a local level, in every country in Europe, um, convenience retail is somehow organized. In some countries, you have a local association that is doing the government relations, um, that is bringing people together on a local level, so the um, retailer buyer can meet the uh, account director from the supplier at some kind of conference or platform. So in every country, something has been organized. Uh, but what is missing, really, in, in, a, in a world that is more and more global and where you really can learn from best practice and innovation from all around the world, is this global aspect to, to have the opportunity, if you work in the convenience retail sector, to meet people like you from elsewhere, from other countries and from other continents, and to learn from them, to, to look at the best practice, to look at the innovation, to learn from regulation elsewhere. And this, is, um, this has been a gap, really. And I think that is what our members really ask us um, to fill, uh, to fill this, this gap for the need to have global best practice and global thought leadership. Um, and I think, um, yeah, that is what we're trying to, to answer here. Well, I like that we're hearing about experts, how Europe has evolved into expert centers, and we're hearing that from the expert on Europe. So uh, I think today was very informative in terms of what uh, retailers can learn from around the world. And we will see you in June in London and in Poland. Thank you for joining us today, Mark. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nets and produced in conjunction with Human Factor Media. For more information, visit convenience.org.